having me. All right. So my talk is, I'm going to keep it short so we could have our lunch earlier. <laughs> but anyway, um, my talk is entitled um, Engaged Buddhism and Ethics of Nonviolence for Online Feminism. So the landscape of the feminist movement has significantly changed with the advent of online and social media platforms. Also known as fourth wave feminism, feminist activists recognize that the fight against sexist oppression and misogyny can be done through the internet and other advanced technologies. Newer feminists continue to f the fight to purge patriarchy, but with the acknowledgement that cyberspaces can liberate women beyond the constraints of traditional venues. Thus, the feminist struggle has moved from the streets to Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and other social media sites. These feminist offshoots have been labeled as digital feminism, popular feminism, cyber feminism, feminist cyber activism, discursive feminism or activism, online feminist activism, uh, even feminist digilantism, um, which is an offshoot from vigilantism, social media activism, and Facebook feminism. While the headway has been made in these feminist campaigns, the fourth wave has had its share of criticisms and controversies. For instance, online feminists have been accused of breaking down the unity and sisterhood of feminists. Furthermore, the movement has supposedly neglected um, they have been accused of breaking down the unity and sisterhood of feminists, and they have supposedly neglected deeper social issues. It lacks political activism and traction and is shallow and inadequate in changing patriarchal structures and systems. So the movement purportedly, purportedly reinforces patriarchy even further. So feminist vigilantism, for instance, uses derogatory and oppressive means, such as trolling, shaming to seek vengeance and discriminate against various groups online. Ironically, some online feminists use feminism as an excuse to engage in exclusionary and hate politics. Such responses are born out of going hard as a strategy to deal with cyberbullying, online abuse, gendered cyber hate, technology facilitated and related violence, online hate speech, cyber harassment and digital and online violence against women. After all, online misogyny and abuse cases have rapidly increased at the fourth wave movement's onset. As a form of retaliation against misogyny, some feminist groups have launched various gender wars online by mirroring the same hate language used by perpetrators. These efforts have been criticized as lacking intersectional awareness, thereby propagating misandry or hate against men and male victimization. So the type of violence initially fought by feminists becomes the same violence some unleash on others. Interestingly, feminists have begun beating the enemy at their own game. So they use the same rules of online violence. So the debate of whether violence begets violence regarding approaches to online feminist activism has thus become a pressing issue. Recent studies on online violence confirm the social learning theory, which states that relatively new behaviors, such as violent behavior, may be acquired by observing and imitating the same violent behavior. Social learning dynamics lead to feminists justifying and necessitating their violent behavior and actions against perpetrators. Unfortunately, instigating violence does not necessarily end further attacks or abusive behavior. Using violent means to curb violence may lead to even more severe issues. So the question that I pose in my paper is, how can um, fourth wave feminism steer clear of the dangers of online activism, specifically the risk of perpetuating the cycle of violence. Now, contemporary Buddhist liberation movements worldwide would propose nonviolent social activist projects or nonviolent resistance, which include peacemaking, combating various acts of violence, 
upholding women's rights by focusing on intersectionality and post-colonial thought. While not directly associated with feminist movements, this Buddhist-inspired social and political activism is what peace activist Thich Nhat Hanh would characterize as an approach to engaged and socially engaged Buddhism. Socially engaged Buddhism promotes expressing love and compassion through concrete actions that benefit society and its individuals. It adheres to the model of activism focused on building relationships through dialogue, nonviolence, interconnectedness among people and between nature, self-awareness, shared power, and solidarity. So it's based on the prescription of loving kindness, wherein love is not just a theory, but also an action. So in this paper, I draw inspiration from the fundamental principles of engaged Buddhism and advocate for an ethical, nonviolent framework for the online feminist activist project. So I answer, I try to answer the following questions. Uh, what are the criticisms and controversies surrounding online feminist activism? How can engaged Buddhism provide an ethical framework for nonviolence in online activism? What are the potential benefits of a collective, self-reflective, self-interrogative, and non-violent means to achieve feminist objectives through online platforms. <coughs> me. I propose a new form of online feminism that strives to consider the global community, ensure ex inclusivity, and be less toxic and more compassionate, focusing on learning from one another and promoting love, healing, and positivity. So this assumes a method of achieving feminist goals through resistance that involves self-reflection, questioning oneself, and using non-violent means. So what I did in my paper is I tried to look at some spiritual activists and proponents of engaged Buddhism. So first, uh, I looked at Gloria Anzaldúa, who is a Latin um, feminist, and she proposes a type of inclusionary politics or spiritual activism wherein politically motivated practices are spiritually aligned. So she asserts that feminist activist projects must reflect empathy and connectedness with others. Of course, Nyat Han um, proposed a type of action and resistance that protects life, decreases violence, and employs social justice and responsible behavior. So he said that this can be done by practicing deep listening, loving speech, and mindful consumption. Of course, uh, the Thai, uh, Sivaraksa, am I pronouncing it correctly, claims a Buddhist solution to global conflict exists. And he talks about justice, democracy, and respect for human rights, which can be acquired through religious and spiritual means. So Nussbaum and Bell Hooks from the West they emphasize the need for love as an ethic that motivates activism and promotes freedom. Now, what I propose here, uh, if you see here a table, which I'll be discussing now, um, basically feminism stays, online feminism um, stays true to the fight for social justice and it highlights intersectional differences, complexities and experiences. However, it should also value differences and complexities among people. However, again, online feminism loses track of what feminism stands for, no, which is to end oppression. So some feminist online actions may deter oppressors by their gain, trying to gain retribution. So under the tenets of engaged Buddhism, the mental and verbal violence that some online feminists unleash such as hatred, divisive speech, harmful words can never be justified. After all, there is no good violence, just violence. As posited by feminist spiritual activists, there can be other ways to fight for the feminist cause. The challenge is continuing the struggle by balancing and engendering beneficial and compassionate actions. So, Basically, um, what I tried to do in my paper in detail is that I put um, the criticisms of online feminism um, on one side and try to find a way to apply engaged Buddhism um, on online feminist actions. So one criticism is that uh, online feminism tends to lack solidarity and unity. 
There are two reasons for these criticisms. One, um, individualized feminist online actions are based on subjectivities and exclusion or hatred against those who are different. Therefore, the question that would arise is whether these asserted sub subjectivities are informed by intersectional awareness. For instance, while the second wave of feminism has been characterized for merely catering to the needs of a homogenous set of women, online feminism has likewise launched a tirade against those who are not vocal against the cause. While various subjectivities and identities are contextualized, actions labeled as feminist should not be instrumental in promoting prejudice against others. So from an engaged Buddhist perspective, Online feminism must acknowledge the interconnectedness between people and champion inclusivity and solidarity. Everyone, after all, has a stake in the struggle, regardless of the factors in their diversity wheel. So Bell Hooks has already mentioned this in her book entitled Feminism is for Everybody, in that feminism will not succeed without everyone's involvement. Men are likewise necessary participants for the success of the movement. Excluding men or other groups and hating on them will not benefit feminism. The solidarity must not focus on people's differences, but on the commonality of feeling. In this case, the feeling of being oppressed and shamed on social media and being recipients of that violence. So a Buddhist way to acknowledge this commonality of feeling is Rukeya Maitra's proposal for a Buddhist framework of mindfulness. So she argues for developing one's agency through a feminist self-consciousness integrated with Buddhist mindfulness, thereby enabling solidarity and true collaboration. So this approach engages oneself and the world through openness and compassion while affirming an interconnected and independent existence. So another criticism of online feminism is that it is detached from social realities and more profound issues. Now, if we look at the bigger picture, you know, there are structures and organizations that play vital roles in changing patriarchal systems and empowering survivors of violence and silenced individuals. Now, such positive changes in the society may be affected if they integrate efforts with governing systems. I'll give you an example. Venerable Metaya Sakipita of Nepal practiced coalition building wherein he lobbied for the education of young women by influencing the elders in Lumbini villages, which in turn resulted in female empowerment and social improvement in his community. Implementing a relationship-oriented approach to feminist online activism can be done by engaging in honest confrontation, dialogue, and reciprocal interaction not through violent approaches like trolling, bashing, online shaming, and defamation. This is described as a justification of violence as a type of antithetical social bonding or the shaping of a group's identity by defining itself in opposition to another group that is rejected. For instance, some online feminist groups claim to be fighting for a good cause, but this is not <laughs> what is supposed to be um, the case. So, feminists must be open to other viewpoints and explore and act compassionate dialogue. An example of such compassionate dialogue can be seen in Nepal's Women's Rehabilitation Center efforts. In the center's observation and experiences, ideological conflicts arise between the various generations of women. Thus, there is a need for an intergenerational feminist dialogue of sorts. Some processes that they have used to enact this dialogue include... Um, Life story sharing, identifying feminist core issues, root cases, knowledge exchange, and knowledge building, alliance building, and developing leadership skills. These undertakings have replaced generational ideological conflicts with intergenerational knowledge and experience exchanges. So let me just fast forward. So just as a conclusion, um, there may be few comments uh, regarding online feminism based on engaged Buddhist framework of nonviolence. The first is that the nature of online platforms, which makes it easier to resort to violence given its easy access and minimal regulation. 
One study even suggests that subversive online activities affect the susceptibility to propaganda persuasion. It must be noted, however, that while the platform itself is problematic, it is the people who instigate and fuel the movement. So if feminists imbibe engaged Buddhist views, engagement in social media platforms would likewise reflect these perspectives. When Gandhi set his agenda to find, fight against injustices while not online, he emphasized the idea of satyagraha, or a mass movement that does not need force or coercion against oppressors. So is it possible to use a non-violent means to enact a feminist resistance? Yes. Aside from embracing the virtues of loving kindness and compassion, it takes a specific commitment to work toward this kind of healing justice. Another comment that may be raised is that being self-reflective in online feminist pursuits is a form of self censorship. Prescribing nonviolence to feminists is like silencing their efforts. Suppose feminists self-censor their hashtags, memes, or comments. What difference would it be from the soft repression of non-state actors or online citizens who use ridicule, stigma, and silencing to repress online feminist movements? Self-reflection and self-interrogation differ from self-censorship in that it puts loving kindness and compassion into the crux of its intent and careful consideration. Furthermore, such action notes the individual's oneness, empathy, and relationship with others. So while the digital sphere is abstract, it is still a venue for group dialogue and understanding. Although the struggle to maintain nonviolence online is actual, Online feminism's potential to motivate transformative power, cultural revision, genuine feminist politics may be enhanced and inspired by engaged Buddhism. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, we all have to eat. <laughs> Mic microphone. I hear. Thank you. So uh, this uh, a very short inquiry on uh, you had presented a few uh, famous personalities yes. and their uh, their overview regarding how this can be applied. Uh, have you um, gone into the interpretations of any of the Buddhist teachings like the? Three pitakas or the suttas to uh, inculcate uh, those ideals into the uh, feministic thoughts. So uh, that is uh, primary question. And second question is, um, how do you think that a model can be created to uh, to fast forward this process of inclusive uh, this engagement of Buddhist ideologies uh, into this online platform for the feminists? to understand properly how it can be applied. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for those questions. Now, for the first one, um, I didn't really look deeply into the Buddhist um, tenets, but what I did was that I tried to extract them from the more famous um, engaged Buddhist uh, activists' um, teachings. Um, particularly, I looked at, um, I, I did this uh, in, in the paper, it's specified uh, the tenets that was taught by uh, Nyat Han, um, because he has this uh, verbatim no, of all the uh, guidelines as to how you can promote nonviolence when it, co it comes to activist efforts. So in my paper, I, I clearly um, enumerated all those um, discussions. At the same time, when it comes to Sivaraksa, I also looked at his um, three types of violence. So, so I also tried to extract um, what are some of the actions that feminists do that fall under these types of violence, which is mental, physical, and um, the last one. So, so yeah, so that's what I did. But looking more deeply into the work, I, I didn't do that anymore. So I just used basically the, the um, thoughts of these primary 
um, proponents on engaged Buddhism. Because if I would go into all of them, oh, yes. that would be going into Buddhist uh, feminist theology, which mm. is not uh, the goal of my paper. Now, for the second question, um, I think the best way that would fast track this inclusivity when it comes to online feminism is that if people would listen <laughs> to the feminists and actually try to make changes. Because, uh, for example, if you look at the history of um, the uh, England's feminist movement, you know, the only time that they were given the right to vote and the only time that they were given the right to um, get out of violent marriages is when they started um, joining all these... Uh, non-peaceful resistance movements and when they were sent to prison it's the only time the government actually listened to them so um as i stated earlier it's not just about online feminism it's about integration it's about coalition building it's about integrating your online efforts with online offline efforts mm -hmm. and coordinating with these structures that actually enforce all these types of oppression which includes the government which includes sorry the church <laughs> catholic church for example and those institutions. So, yeah, that's that's what I think, <laughs> basically. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.